Hello there, welcome back. In today's video, we are going to be jumping back in time, back to 1927. We're going to be looking through this cookbook. This is Everyday Foods, and it was the textbook that my grandmother used back in high school when she took her, I'm not exactly sure what it was called when she took it, but like the equivalence of like a home ec slash food and nutrition sort of deal. So this is half textbook, half cookbook, but 100% a deep dive into the culture surrounding the foods of the early 1900s. And here is the cookbook. We, yes, we do keep it in a plastic Ziploc bag because it is quite old and it is falling apart. A blue binding. And this is Everyday Foods by Harris and Lacey. All right, and let's open it up to see. Aw, I, I never opened it up to this cover. I always opened it up like within the book and I never noticed she wrote her name out here. All right, opening it up, ah, we can see. This is quintessential, her recipes. Just, this is not her handwriting, but it was passed down th through all of us because my mom does this and I do this as well. Don't write what the recipe is or really what to do with it. Just <laughs> write the ingredients down. Here is your title page. Almost 100 years old. It is copyright 1927. So my grandmother was born in 1914. This would have been her high school textbook. The preface says that it was written as a food study, but also primarily for young girls to teach them pretty much how to cook and ways about the kitchen and things like that, because this is definitely a textbook as well as a cookbook. It's going to have pictures like this, the figures. It's going to have what to do for different things. So like how to make sure that you're cooking your dried fruit properly, as well as problems, homework problems. So how many teaspoons in a tablespoon? If you know that answer, leave it in the comments down below. We of course have the chapter on the importance of milk. All right, so in the 1920s, how much water should we drink? Half dozen glasses of water for sure, so six glasses. So a little, a little fewer than the eight glasses uh, they tell us to drink today. Shall we drink water at mealtime? So my grandmother would always have a glass of water or whatnot uh, at the dinner table with her, but she never drank it until after the meal. And I always, I don't know, I always thought that was just a, a funny, like weird quirk about her until I was looking through this and I read this. So it says when you should drink the water, but... One caution is necessary. Water must not be used to wash down food. Then it is harmful for two reasons. The food is not properly masticated, but is swallowed in hunks, unmixed with saliva and digestive juice. That sounds disgusting. Uh, and two, washing down food leads to eating too rapidly and often to overeating. So I wonder if this is the reason, because it was in her textbook, that even as an an old lady, she, she did not drink water while she was eating. We have the different types of tea, the different types of coffee as well. We go into the breakfast cereals with your simple sugar, double sugar, and complex sugars, and what they are all called, all of the uh, different types of carbohydrates, which is definitely something I know that people tend to think that like, what we consider modern is like we're modern and sophisticated and people of ye olden days were stupid for lack of a better word but no the the food sciences the food sciences has been around since honestly the victorian era now some of it was a little like yeah a little shifty but i really like seeing this very early 1900s representation of that that they had all of this knowledge some of it a little misguided, but they did have that knowledge. You also see what is acceptable for breakfast in the 1920s, very much like today. So different types of toast. You can have dry or butter toast, cheese toast, cinnamon toast. Not the cinnamon toast crunch, though. I thought this was really cool. So the composition of the different materials, the different food materials. So how much of the egg is water? What percentage is protein, fat? etc. Uh, for the whole egg, the egg and yolk, cottage cheese, and cream cheese. So the textbook went from, okay, here is what would make up a breakfast 
to the preparation and serving of the breakfast. And they did this for every meal actually. And so this would be on a typical menu, a typical breakfast menu of the 1920s or what they suggested, I guess for like a middle-class family. So you would have fruits, hot cereal and cream, eggs, hot rolls, cocoa or coffee. That is a lot of food. That sounds like a continental breakfast right there. Marketing, uh, not marketing like we think of marketing today, but when you go to the market, how much of everything should you buy per week? I think that is pretty cool there. Even how you should work a schedule, like when should you light the oven? How long is it going to take for you to wash your dishes? All of that was in this book. And of course, because it was a textbook, home projects. Ooh, pecan pie. That looks delicious. And then, I don't know, something with two eggs, one cup of syrup, salt, van vanilla uh, and sugar and butter to the lunch and supper and or supper i really liked this it broke down what sort of meals you would have if you were dining in cold weather or hot weather so soups were for cold weather but apparently not for hot weather they apparently didn't have any cold soups back then <laughs> at least in the states uh, what vegetables you should have and of course it looks like it's because these are the vegetables in season uh, what salads so in the cold weather you would not use any sort of salads what sort of breads any sort of sandwiches drinks your main dishes entire chapter on the vegetables so that you could you know prevent scurvy how cool are these stamps though from 1939 wow just like before with the different proteins, you have the composition of the different vegetable food material, how much is carbohydrate, how much is protein, etc. Good to know about salads. One, that they can be seen as laxative, but also that even back then, they found that salads were an economical thing because choice leftover vegetables, fruits, and meats may be used in salads. Great way to use up whatever is in your fridge or ice box as it would have been called back then how to make various salad dressings and of course the school lunch we have here a, a really handy illustration of what to say no to so for school lunches don't say say no to lollipops much meat but few vegetables say no to, <laughs> to coffee and thin soup but do say yes to milk thick soup little meat and mini vegetables. I really like what this is broken down into, not necessarily calling it like, nowhere in this whole cookbook slash textbook slash instruction manual does it ever say any sort of verbiage of good food and, and bad food, which I really do like because I don't believe there are such things as good and bad foods, uh, but they have that these are building foods. These are the energy foods and then the, protect, the regulatory and protective foods. Ooh, an apple fritter. Never had a banana fritter though, have you? What you should have for dinner. This section is when we get into the like, what is more economical, eating at home, like cooking at home, or going out to eat. So this would be a, a suggestion sort of thing of going out to eat. So for $1.50, I personally think this is very economical, but you know, of the time, probably not. Uh, you would get a, sh a shrimp cocktail, or I'm assuming uh, the relish, mangoes, tartar sauce, all of this, uh, veal chops on toast, little calf tongues, uh, you get pudding, fruit sauce, butterscotch pie, that sounds delicious. All of these things, uh, but the same dinner with the sirloin steak, bump it up 50 cents and that is two dollars and then we get into this as well so we have more problems like this this is how much all of these things would cost and i assume that this is cents and because it's the 1920s and not actual dollars but they had things on this menu of french boneless sardines chicken a la king lettuce and grapefruit which does not sound appealing at all Baked apple and cream, which does. How to choose different cuts of meat, how to choose, see the different, uh, the retail cuts, 
versus wholesale cuts, different types of fish are in here as well, the vegetables. And then we get into the part where the book is of course broken, into calories per day. It looks like it's only for children though that I'm seeing this. So they're recommending that for like 16 to 17 year olds, boys should get up to 3,400 calories and girls should get up to uh, 2,550. And then here we go for adults, based on what your occupation is, what they suggest your calories are. So if you're a lumberman, they suggest that the most you get are 5,300. Um, and if you're a laundress, 33.50, which that doesn't seem like a lot if you're doing that much manual labor. The calcium of the different foods. Then it goes from being all about the food to all about the home and the dining experience. So the dual purpose of dining rooms, how to set tables. I really like this dining room, by the way. How to set tables, the silverware that you will need, table etiquette as well. All of these things of how to use the fork and knife properly how to take care of the sick. So they recommend that if you have a liquid diet, of course, all of, ooh, cereal gruels, that just sounds gross, but all of these things um, versus a soft diet versus just a light diet, of course, depending on what sickness the person had, you would give them that. I don't think that plain gelatin would be very good. I've never had it, but I don't think it would be. They have the pressure cooker, which I've never used. I am scared to use a pressure cooker. Have you used one? Let me know. And then you go into the actual cookbook portion. And I am thinking of starting a little mini series where I cook things out of this cookbook portion. Let me know in the comments down below or give this video a thumbs up if you would be interested in seeing that. So they have things from percolated coffee to drip coffee, how to make homemade or from scratch, I guess, hot chocolate how to make waffles, sour milk, sweet milk versus sour milk, different breads. My favorite part of this cookbook because I love pie, the pie section. And then the back, you, of course, you have like most textbooks even today have. If you know your school still uses, if your school district still use textbooks, you have your appendix that has everything really easy in like table format as well as your index. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little look back in time with me. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of your day with me. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you real soon.